So we become very, in some ways, more preoccupied than ever with parents, even in the time of, of Freud, in ways that are problematic because people are also led to feel like, well, if your parent traumatized you, you don't owe them anything. And that's why I say that the moral framework has changed, that our, the, our morality has become in many ways more self-centered. Welcome to NBC Life. I'm Rochelle Lamb, veteran NBC trainer and relationship coach, helping listeners navigate interpersonal conflict and ground more deeply into relational living. Greetings, fellow humans. Today, on my 75th podcast episode, I welcome a very special guest, Dr. Joshua Coleman. We spoke over video a few days ago, so if you would prefer to watch, you'll have to head over to Spotify or YouTube. And of course, you can simply stick with the audio. Our topic, parental estrangement. Good morning, Dr. Joshua Coleman. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation to speak about your work. Dr. Coleman is a psychologist in private practice in the San Francisco Bay Area. He's written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, NBC Think, The Behavioral Scientist, CNN, Market Watch, The San Francisco Chronicle, Greater Good Magazine, Aon, Huffington Post, Psychology Today, Variety, and more. He's given talks to the faculties at Harvard, the Weill Cornell Department of Psychiatry, and other academic institutions. He is the author of numerous articles and chapters and has written four books, The Rules of Estrangement, The Marriage Makeover, Finding Happiness in Imperfect Harmony, The Lazy Husband, How to Get Men to Do More Parenting and Housework. That sounds like a good one. Uh, mm -hmm. When Parents Hurt, Compassionate Strategies When You and Your Grown Child Don't Get Along. He is the co-editor of seven online volumes of unconventional wisdom, news you can use, a compendium of noteworthy research on the contemporary family, gender, sexuality, poverty, and work family issues. His books have been translated into several languages. He is the father of three adult children and has a grandchild. Did I get that right? Got that right, yeah. Okay, Dr. Coleman, it's so good to speak with you. Likewise, good to be here. Now, as you know, I had uh, indicated in my invitation to you that I am a certified trainer of nonviolent communication, and that's uh, work that I've been doing for the past 20 years. And I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that body of work. I am, yes. Yes. And Dr. Marshall Rosenberg used to say, if you want to be happy, don't have children, go straight to grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> now, that would get a chuckle out of people, but there's some... There's some reality, unfortunately, in that mm -hmm. message. And it's so hard these days to be a parent as well as a grandparent. But um, mm -hmm. I was hoping to speak to you about what do you think is happening out there? It's a silent epidemic. And what I hope to, to do in the time that we have together is to give some voice to that. So. So by the it, you mean parental estrangement. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. This is about parental estrangement, folks. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Just wanted to make sure we have the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, currently, most recent study, um, comprehensive study, show that 26% of fathers uh, are likely to go through an estrangement. Uh, they're particularly at risk of going through an estrangement with their daughters. Um, that same study said around 67% of mothers, but other studies have put it closer to between 10 and 12% of mothers. I suspect that's higher, but it's still a very, both are very worrisome numbers. So the question is, um, people sometimes will say, well, haven't there always been estrangements? And the answer is, of course, yes, there have. I would, I'm, I would argue that not nearly at the numbers that we're seeing today, and also that the meaning was very, very different. I, I don't think that even when uh, estrangements happened, say prior to the 1960s or 70s, it was seen as an act of existential courage or as a pathway to identity or protection of one's mental health, even though it may have been, you know, in some ways conceived as such. It certainly wasn't tied to this much more powerfully identitarian model that we've evolved over the past 
half century, where the moral framework of the governs family life has radically changed, where for millennia, it was really honor thy mother and thy father, respect thy elders, family is forever. Family was not only the core economic unit, it was in many ways the core social unit. Um, and in the 1960s and continuing unabated into the present, it's begun to shift much more towards um, towards the idea that um, one doesn't owe one's parents anything, respect is earned, that um, relationships with parents has to be much more constituted on what the British sociologist Anthony Giddens referred to as pure relationships, that those being those that are purely constituted on the basis of um, intimacy, uh, the ability to communicate, be in line with the person's ideals for happiness, et cetera. Um, so that's that's an incredibly powerful shift that's occurred um, in the past half century. You add to that uh, fairly stable rates of 50% of population being divorced. Um, divorce in my own research and in others shows that people who are divorced are at much higher risk of a later estrangement than those who aren't. And those parents who never married are, are very high risk, particularly fathers, a very high percentage of fathers who never marry the mother are fall out of contact uh, with their children within three to five years. Um, rising rates of individualism, preoccupation with the self, one's happiness, one's identity, one's feelings of separation, individuation tied to um, uh, social media, uh, which can kind of fan the flames of the social contagion aspect of this. TikTok influencers, Instagram influencers who talk about borderline narcissistic parents and how the 10 reasons you should end contact with your parents. All these things have persisted in creating uh, the climate where estrangement is considered not only a, a reasonable thing to do, but a pathway towards one's mental health. Now, in fact, for some people, it is. There are truly destructive parents out there who are unrepentant, who are unwilling to change or modify their behavior or collaborate with the adult child in ways that would make the adult child feel respected or heard or cared about or empathized with. Uh, but those aren't, those aren't the only people that become uh, estranged. It's not only abusive parents who are becoming estranged. There, there are other pathways, just briefly, I would say, um, so there's divorce, there's mental illness, certainly in the parent, but also in the adult child. There's when the adult child gets married, the husband or wife says, choose them or me, you can't have both. There's problematic therapists who assume everything has a traumatic uh, uh, underpinning and, and encourages uh, estrangement as a, a remedy for that. And for a certain percentage of adult children, estrangement can be the only way they know how to feel separate from parents who've been to the child's perspective, consciously or unconsciously, overly involved, overly enmeshed, overly caretaking. So there are a bunch of different pathways to estrangement today, um, other than parental abuse or neglect. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to unpack there, everything yeah. you just said. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I know uh, I get your newsletter and I know you like to watch certain uh, shows on TV. I'm wondering if you've ever seen Billions. I have seen billions, yes. Okay, so so uh, I don't know if you recall, but there's a scene in in that series where the lawyer is talking to uh, Wendy, the psychologist, and she's been having some marital dispute with her husband. Uh -huh. And the lawyer looks at her and he says, and then he did because you did, because his parents and your parents, because America because England, because ancient Rome, because primordial ooze, which oh. kind of summarizes very nicely what you just said. I mean, there are so many pathways. There's so much that is linked to what occurs in estrangement. But I, I yeah. want to look at the, the field of psychology in therapy. And there was a book written by James Hillman. Are you familiar with him? So he was a bit of a, he's a Jungian psychologist, but this is a book written in 90, 1992. And its title is... We've had 100 years of psychotherapy and the world's getting worse. And one <laughs> of the things he says in it, which I, I took a quote here, is the principal content of American psychology is developmental psychology. 
what happened to you earlier is the cause of what happened to you later. That's the basic theory. Our history is our causality. No other culture would do that. If you're out of your mind in another culture or quite disturbed or impotent or anorexic, you look at what you've been eating, who's been casting spells on you, what taboo you've crossed, what you haven't done right. When you last missed reverence to the gods or didn't take part in the dance, broke some tribal custom, it would never Never be what happened to you with your mother and your father 40 years ago. Only our culture uses that model, that myth. And uh, I think you would absolutely wholeheartedly agree with that. (laughs) Yeah, I love that quote. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it's it's a great book. And it's, you know, so still fresh today, you know, 30 years later. So we can add that uh, now we've had 100 and 30 years of psychotherapy and the world's definitely getting worse. Yeah. Uh, Hillman is no longer alive, but uh, I'm not sure if he saw this coming probably in some <laughs> way, but he doesn't speak about estrangement in that book. Yeah. And so I attended uh, your course two years ago for therapists and I was struck at how many were themselves estranged. Yeah. So, you know, it makes you wonder, why well, is there something to do with uh, therapy uh, or therapists themselves? I don't think that's the case because I think most people come to this field because they want to uh, do better and make the world a better place. And I think they're very sincere in that. I agree. But there is something to be said. You have spoken about therapy and the, we'll say the shadow side of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, can you speak to that? Sure. Yeah. I think there's a quote by the Israeli sociologist, Eva Elouz, that I think really captures this moment. And she says, today our lives are plotted backwards. What's a dysfunctional family? It's a family where your needs weren't met. How do you know your needs weren't met? By looking at your present condition. So there's, we've become very obsessed with traumas. The body keeps the score. Are there books about trauma that have become you know, incredibly popular? And there's, there's wisdom in the body keeps the score. There's also a lot about it that's highly problematic in the way that it sort of assumes that every traumatic experience has a place in the body. First of all, it doesn't have a place in the body, it has a place in the brain. So the body's not really keeping the score there. The brain, mm-hmm. the brain is. But to your point, there's a kind of an emotional determinism, which is faulty on its face. If we just look at uh, traumas, the research by Joel Paris at the University of Toronto and others, such as George Bonanno at Columbia University, shows that even if you've been through a truly traumatic event, only 10% of the population um, will experience PTSD. So the idea that any traumatic event your body's keeping the score of it. It has long-term implications. Or if you're having problems to sort of, to get back to Eva Eluza's quote, um, that, that you know, you have to assume a dysfunctional family is at the core of it, is a very problematic way of, um, of figuring out who you are and who the causal agents in your life are and what are the causal agents in your life are. So we become very, in some ways, more preoccupied than ever with parents, even in the time of, of Freud in ways that are problematic because people are also led to feel like, well, if your parent traumatized you, you don't owe them anything. And that's why I say that the moral framework has changed, that our, the, our morality has become in many ways more self-centered, much more oriented towards, does this relationship facilitate my happiness and my personal growth or doesn't it? If it doesn't, not only can I get rid of that person, but I should get rid of that person. In fact, it's an act of existential courage to reject them and an act of existential cowardice uh, to keep them in my life. And in truth, the um, so we'll do, just to dial back briefly to the research on on traumas. Even those who've had um, you know really egregious traumatic incidents and incest, physical abuse, abject neglect, still the majority of the the, the in general the tale is one of resilience, not long term effects. It's something like only like twenty five percent of people who've had terrible experiences have long term. Uh, res- uh, long-term effects. Now, the effects, though, can be more a result of poverty um, and social isolation and that kind of thing, less than parenting or parents per se. So the research in general shows that about only 20% of the variance that we see, and by that, you know, we, we mean that only 20% of the outcome that people have is really attributable to parenting. 
it's uh, a bigger percentage is attributed to genetics, to cohort, meaning the, the generation that you grow up in, according to the research of Gene Twenge, random good luck, random bad luck, who your siblings were, what other experiences you've had with important people, positive or negative. So this idea that it all boils down to parents is, first of all, false, but also highly problematic because it green lights estrangement from parents who are, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, highly workable. Mm hmm. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that uh, children are, um, or anyone, is there a child of the time, more so of the time than of your parents? I mean, certainly in my own case, I have four brothers and we have the same parents. And I just, uh, you know, marvel at how incredibly different we are. And yet there is something to be said. You mentioned uh, Twenge and her work on generations. And yeah. I find it fascinating, just the idea of a generation gap. Um, I know it's a it's a real thing and it exists, but I also know that I've always been interested in cultural anthropology and sure. looking at other cultures, how they function yep. and how they maintain uh, traditions, how they are. Uh, they do practice a real uh, lived relationship with their ancestors, with mm -hmm. their elders. Yep. And I don't believe they're falling apart like our modern society is. And if they are falling apart, it's because of the impact that the modern world has as it encroaches their ways. Yeah. Um, I yeah. Agree. Yeah. I share your interest in cultural anthropology. I don't know if you've had a chance yet to read um, Joseph Heinrich's book, The Weirdest People in the World. Um, if you like cultural anthropology, you'll, you'll really like this book. Um, have you read it yet? If, I know? have not. I have not. I'm not familiar with it, but yeah, I will you'll definitely look definitely into that. Appreciate it. The weird is an acronym for wealthy, educated, industrialized. Uh, no, it's Western educated, industrialized, rich democracies. And one of the things that Heinrich shows is that he contrasts it with um, what he says is we're the weirdest people in the world because no other society is so oriented around individualism, personal happiness, separation, individuation, um, and that that's our moral framework. He said in, in most of the rest of the world, they're much more communitarian in their outlook and perspective. Their identity becomes much more from the group and their relationships. And the research, if you look at the, the research by, say, Iris Mouse at um, uh, UC Berkeley, it's M-A-U-S-S, -S, she found that in those countries that define happiness in terms of one's relationship with others, which we now know is one of the best predictors of happiness, that those countries have much higher rates of happiness than those countries like the US that define happiness in terms of our personal growth and our aspirations towards individuality, um, etc. So culture, to your point, really does matter. We have you know, one of the most wealthy countries in the world, we're also one of the most depressed. And I think it's in part because the only thing that unites us is, our, you know, is capitalism, is our sort of aspirations towards wealth and success and status, whereas in other cultures, they have a different set of principles to organize their lives and relationships and identities around. Um, but I think to circle back to your, your point about um, sort of a child of the times, I think it's very true that that the younger cohort, Generation Z, those born after 1995, have incredibly high rates of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts. And as Twenge shows, that's a bigger predictor. The generation's a bigger predictor than any particular family formation. So it just shows that this era of social media, of cell phones, of constant comparison exposure um, is, is very toxic and destructive to the lives of these young people. The problem is that <clears throat> a certain percentage of them are going to end up in therapy with some therapist who assumes everything has a traumatic background to it. And, you know, so it's going to assume that their suicidal ideation comes from a neglectful mother or father and that some hidden trauma um, and put that child on a pathway towards a later estrangement. Mm. Um, I'm going to read to you something uh, that I found yesterday on uh, Walrus magazine, and it's titled The Power of Indigenous Kinship to Heal the Spirits of the Next Generation. Indigenous Peoples Are Relearning Rites of Passage. And this was published in uh, 2018. 
written by Tanya Talaga, and she's a Canadian journalist and acclaimed author of Anishinaabe and Polish descent. In case anybody doesn't know, the Anishinaabe are a group of culturally related Indigenous peoples present in the Great Lakes region of Canada and the U.S. They include the Ojibwe, Odawa, Potawatomi, Mississaugas, Nipissing, and Algonquin people. So here's what she wrote. Before an Anishinaabe woman gives birth to a child, Sam Ak Nipi Nesquam tells me she sings to them. She speaks to them when she's in a good place, and she thanks them for coming into the family's life. The baby is also told stories of their history, so they know who they are when they are born. They are prepared. When they come screaming into being, they are met by a bevy of women, each of whom has a special role to play in the birthing process. Traditionally, when a child is born, the elders come to give the child a name they will carry for the rest of their days. A naming ceremony can happen at any time when it does the child enters into the realm of the tribe. Attachments, kinship, and family tell us who we are and where we come from. They give us a sense of dignity, a sense of belonging right from birth. In Indigenous cultures, family units go beyond the traditional nuclear family living together in one house. Families are extensive, networks of strong, connective kinship. They are often entire communities. If a child is orphaned or if their biological parents are unable to care for them, the broader family takes over the primary rearing of that child. Instead of having one mother, the child could have a number of maternal figures. But if a child is taken away from their parents, their extended family, their community, they suffer multiple losses. And I wanted to underscore that because I just think if you compare that uh, in Indigenous uh, understanding of life and family and kinship and connection and ancestry, and then you look at, you know, the the people who are coming to see you uh, regularly, who there are too many (laughs) for you to handle, Uh, (laughs) for you to be able to attend to, that um, you can see the incredible poverty. Mm-hmm. that's that's occurred so in this and what i just read i i can even though she hasn't used the words but there is a sense of what i would say filial duty and obligation yeah and in my line of work where we teach people how to meet their needs i have been especially in the past 10 years very concerned about that because mm. if our understanding of needs is this is what makes me happy and it's only that. And if it, right. if I feel uncomfortable, unsafe, or whatever it is, that means this is no good. Right. And so, and you must go. I cut you off, uh, cat. Cut all ties, and uh-huh. don't talk to me again. I'm wondering if you, what do you think about what's happened to duty and obligation? This idea that if it's only good for us, but there's a bigger world, isn't there? Well, right. And one of the tragedies, you know, to go back to what you were saying about the, you know, the more tribal uh, kind of formation of identity is that um, today, if an adult child cuts off contact with a parent, they also cut off contact to access to the grandchildren, uh, which is, and these are often grandchildren, grandparents who are very involved in the lives of the grandchildren, and they often justify it. I mean, sometimes it's done because the grandparents weren't appropriately respectful of the grant of the parents um, rules and engagement etc and they were basically unwilling to to be more accommodating in ways that would make you sympathetic to why the that parent might have wanted to cut off their you know the grandparents from access but that's not typically in my experience the majority of uh, estrangements that happen from grandparents typically they're a casualty of the parent adult child relationship and usually the adult child's justifying it by saying well if it's not good for me, if it's triggering to me, if it's upsetting to me, then that interferes with my capacity to be a good parent. So it's actually better for my, you know, my children as well, which I frankly find a kind of a self-centered orientation towards one's own children. People can be, you know, not great parents, but amazing grandparents and grandchildren. The grandparent-grandchild relationship is a very unique kind of relationship that's that's constituted on a kind of shared vulnerability and innocence and sort of to, to go back to your your initial quote that you know you should skip parenting and go great <laughs> yeah. grandparenting I it know. is a very, it's a qualitatively different kind of relationship so it's an enormous loss not only to the grandparents but to the grandchildren as well and it also models that 
people can be, you know, for generations that's so preoccupied with trauma that you can uh, have a, a fundamental important relationship with a grandparent just completely suddenly taken out of your life. It sort of models for them not only that trauma, but also um, that that's a reasonable way to to handle relationships, to just cut people out who are disappointing you or upsetting you or uh, or bothering you. So um, I think it's a very fragile way to run a society. We're, we're, we're social beings, we're tribal beings. And, you know, currently our tribes are found more politically or online, but those are not, those are not very stable entities. And they're also not entities that can really provide deeper meaning or value in the way that we all need as humans. We all as humans need that sense of reflection and care and honor and respect that comes from close intimate ties. Um, typically with family, I guess it doesn't have to come with family, but I think people sometimes make the mistake of assuming that others are going to be as dedicated to them as their own family was. And that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you think there's uh, what kind of a reform, if you will, do you think would get people to, uh, to think more deeply about, about obligations and about, their duties. You know, one of the things I'll just say that Marshall Rosenberg used to say, he used to say, never do anything out of a sense of duty and obligation. But he said, do it. Be but you see, that's it's problematic to me that if you just take that, and as like many things, you just take that quote, and you, it depends on how you're looking at it. You look at it and you go, oh, well, I'm just going to take care of the big old me then. Right. Instead of he, he would encourage people to be doing things that were in service to life. So if you're in service to life, that includes being in service to relationship, includes being in service to the bigger picture. So then you don't do it with an, oh, I have to do this energy, but you do this because I recognize that I'm feeding the life that fed me would mm -hmm. be a way of uh, saying that. And in, in fact, you are cutting off and saying no to the life that actually fed you. Yeah. Right. No, I think that's, that's a nice way to... To put it, I heard a quote, um, I think it was by Fairbairn, the object relations, or no, it was Hans Lowold, um, the object relations person. And he said something like, um, the goal is to take the, uh, to turn ghosts into ancestors. Um, and the idea is that if you're feeling tormented by your past or your parents or the things that they did, then there's still sort of ghosts sort of looking for a home inside you so that if they can rest. Ancestors are um, have been sort of properly buried and can sort of operate as a source of wisdom and guidance. And, you know, the more problematic parts of the relationship could be thought of as being being buried. So I like the idea of that as an orientation, that even if your parents were highly problematic, and many are, that there still may be um, quite a bit about them or um, their relationship to you that is still salvageable and valuable, even, even in kind of an ancestor role. And there may be ways to sort of compartmentalize or manage the difficult parts of them, because everybody, including ourselves, um, have very difficult parts of them. Um, but it's sort of at the societal level, it's a it's a bigger challenge. I think we need a different kind of a narrative in our our culture. It's certainly one that I'm committed to doing. And I think that that podcasts like this, where we're sort of shining a light on the darker underside of estrangement, where it's not to be sort of automatically considered to be such a, a great response, uh, but has you know, estrangements, even if they might be considered necessary by either you or me as individual therapists working with the individual client, there's still a cataclysmic event for the rest of the family. It, they can be divide. They can divide parents against each other. Uh, they can turn grandparent upon. Uh, you know, they can cut out grand grandparents from grandchildren. Siblings can turn on each other. Aunts and uncles can get brought into into the mix. So even when it might seem objectively necessary. Uh, to cut out this so-called toxic family member. And we have to be thinking about the larger culture and the larger family system because they inevitably do fracture whole family systems. And I think that has to all be thought through by us as therapists. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever heard of the book, The Sibling Society by Robert Bly? No, so, I know Robert Bly, but I haven't yeah, heard of it. Yeah, so uh, he's an essayist and poet. And 
he wrote that book as well as many other books that are associated with uh, the man's movement and mythology and so forth. But uh, in an interview with the Utni reader, he said, I use the phrase sibling society to suggest a culture fundamentally without fathers, mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers, or ancestors. The thinking is horizontal. The sibling society is the flattening out of the previously democratic society. What, what do you take to mean from that? Uh, well, I just, I take it to mean uh, that chaos is loosened on the world. I was thinking of a poem by uh, Yeats, you know, the, the center has law is, is cannot hold. Oh. So things are fragmenting. Uh, that's how I would say it. So it's, it. There's a kind of a, a chaos, a, an insanity that's loosened onto the world. I see. So he wasn't endorsing the sibling society. He oh, was- no, 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 no. It is a scathing. Oh, okay. He is, oh, okay. you know, he's just saying, no, this is a, a very uh, negative thing. And the outcome of it, I think we're seeing it, which is why, you know, uh, if we look at a silent epidemic, it's, it's actually doing so much damage in its yeah. silence. And so, yeah. you know, um, a question that I have for you, is is this you know most of the people who contact you are estranged parents correct and correct. they're not the adult children who are doing the estrangement who are saying hey what do i do about the fact that i've estranged my parent right but, so for our purposes here so i want you to imagine for a moment that you are speaking to a group of adults who have already cut off contact with their parents and they have agreed to let down their guard and listen to you with an open mind. What would you say to them? Well, I mean, I do do a lot of reconciliation therapy with adult children who are willing to, um, who are willing to um, do a few sessions with the parent to see if they're, they're open to um, changing. And what I mean, what I tell them before I meet with them and the parent is you get to set the terms of the relationship that, um, that my therapeutic approach is that I do prioritize the happiness and well-being of the adult child for a number of different reasons. One is I think the buck does stop with us as parents, that if anybody's going to take the high road, the parent has to, that all people have blind spots um, and parents, in, you know, not necessarily in particular, but it's that, that a parent could reasonably, credibly feel like they did a good job and their child could credibly feel like they didn't do a good job or was very hurtful and destructive. Um, so if I'm preparing somebody for family therapy, I let the adult child know that, that the purpose and goal of our work together is for me to help support you, uh, in helping your parent do a deeper dive into why you felt like the estrangement was the healthiest thing for you to do. Um, but that may be different if I were talking to a group of adult estranged children who hadn't yet, uh, considered or hadn't yet, weren't yet willing to kind of get into the ring with their parents. So, so to them, um, I guess I would want them to, to think through kind of the, the whole system of, of it, whether it was felt sort of worth it to them, not purely from the perspective of their own happiness and the protection of their mental health, but whether or not their mental health could in fact be strengthened or made more resilient by engaging the parent, whether they had approached the parent in a way that actually invited more self-reflection rather than defensiveness. I mean, I read letters from adult children all the time where the parent, of course, is going to respond offensively. Well, my therapist said, you're a narcissist. My therapist said, you're gaslighting me. You know, I went on some website and you like, you know, checked all the boxes. And um, so it's not going to make any parent respond in the way that, that is going to invite the kind of self-reflection that they want and need and potentially could get. So I would encourage them to approach the parent in a way that would invite more self-reflection and openness. And, you know, typically that's through, you know, what we therapists call the complaint sandwich, where you start with a compliment and say, this is what you valued or like about the parent or person, then talk about what was problematic and then end with some kind of a, a compliment. Parents, even the worst of parents still, um, get a lot of their identity from being a parent and being told you were a bad parent or you failed your child is a very hard thing for any parent to, to hear. So it has to be approached with enormous delicacy. The other thing that I would say is that, um, you know, everything we've learned about from cognitive behavior therapy is that facing the things that we're the most triggered by or 
hurt by um, is the thing that makes us the most resilient. So I'll sometimes tell an adult child who's debating about it, I'll say, well, it's, that is therapeutic. Even if your parent can't change or won't change, or you decide not to continue to work with them and me or have a relationship with them, it's still psychologically better for you to be able to uh, tell them in a reasonable way what your complaints are, because it's a way of sort of engaging with a person that you have all these strong, powerful feelings about. Parents always feel like, oh, I don't mean anything to my child or they couldn't do that. But often it's quite the opposite. Often it's that the parent means too much to the adult child. And that's why they have to estrange themselves because the child, the parent is just too big in that child's mind. So those would be a few of the things that I would probably want to say. Mm -hmm. It takes a village to raise a child. We hear that. And it just seems like so much falls on the parents in spite of the fact that we recognize it takes a village. Right. I'm thinking about when the best, one of the best therapy sessions be that, look, you're spending so much time speaking about your parents right now, but I'd like you to speak about the people who were absent, who mm -hmm. you never met, who you couldn't meet because of the culture. Mm -hmm. What What do you have to say to that? I mean, I would just want to kind of dislodge that thinking that it just all accrues to the parents. It just seems like such a tragedy <laughs> that, that it goes that way. <laughs> well, we're in agreement about that for, for sure, that way too much <clears throat> emphasis is being put on and blamed on um, parents. And, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky if your client comes in and is complaining about the parent to shift the topic off of them. So we certainly have to be able to show compassion and empathy and help them to, to see what part the parents could have caused, but it, you know, with a healthier person, it's, you can be useful to help them see that their anxiety or depression may not be purely because of parental neglect or traumas, but may also be a result of other experiences, for example, a vulnerable temperament, genetics, you know, there's just so many other pathways towards depression and anxiety, for example, other than bad parenting. Um, so yes, I think your idea about finding other interpretations can be really, really useful. Um, despite the fact that the culture is still currently very much wedded to the idea that everything boils down to parental abuse and neglect, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I have a, a, a personal story about my father. So I had a challenging relationship with my father and I just found him very uh, controlling and he, everything had to be perfect. And, and so I was afraid of him. I was a really shy, quiet kid and I was the eldest for younger brothers but when I was in my, I guess it was 40s, I wrote my father a letter. Yeah. And it was a long letter. And it was very detailed. I, I still have the letter. And I provided details of events that had happened. It would never have occurred to me to say, you were emotionally abusive. It just simply wouldn't have. But now that's the language. Yeah. Um, and I think that the fact that I was detailed and itemized everything. And I, I didn't threaten him, but I did. There was a tone there of, if you don't change your ways, you know, we're done. And I had also moved halfway across the country, mm. uh, all the way across the country, in fact, to the West Coast. Mm. And so he wrote back to me and to his credit, he wrote back a very lengthy, heartfelt letter. But I can yeah. say this, and and our relationship was never never became estranged, you know. Wow. In fact, it only improved over time until right. his death uh, eight years ago. But when I received his letter, I remember not being quite satisfied mm -hmm. that it was missing something. I still have that letter, and I came across it about a month ago, and I reread it, and it struck me very differently Interesting. now uh -huh. because. I am now the age that he would have been when he wrote that. Uh, and uh. so that catching up to your parents, you know, uh, catching up to their age, having kids of your own, yeah. uh, you know, going through the distress of that, uh, divorces, whatever it is that happens to you. But I remember reading it and feeling a, a kind of fondness and tenderness for him that I had mm. not felt uh, before. Uh -huh. And and I worry that if if people don't, stick to it like just you know hold on no they're not your perfect idea of a parent right. they'll never be i don't know that that even exists it you know yeah. it's right. it's a fairy tale but uh but there's there's enormous uh wealth there 
for for us to have. And one of the things I thought about, too, was that when I moved across the country with my kids, something I now wish had happened but never occurred was to have probably not my parents, but maybe an older person their age come up to me and say, are you really thinking this thing through moving Hmm. across the country? Uh Sounds like a, you know, you're not doing it for a job. It just, you just want to live out West. You're tired of snow, that kind of thing. Uh, I just want to remind you that by doing that, you are ensuring that your children don't have grandparents. Uh They're they're Uh just going to be kind of, you know, they show up once every couple of years. Uh And that's what you're doing. Yeah. I, I I can't stop you, but I'm trying to. Yeah. And I'm doing that out of a kindness to you. Mm-hmm. And I would have loved to have heard something like that. So yeah. I'm realizing how I did not have elders in my life and how there are very few of them around. Very few people ask, like, what do you think about me doing this? Right. You know? And when people get married, there's all those folks who are invited to the wedding, hopefully not for just a big drunk, you know? Right. That they're there for a reason, that they're standing there because they know you're going to get into trouble. They know this is going to be a <laughs> miserable affair <laughs> at some point, right? I mean, it's, right. sure it's happy today, point. but you're going to go through course, the ups and to. downs. Right, exactly. And when you hit the downs, don't you eject from from your the vows that you made. You right. come calling all, all on all of us. And I, I wish someone would say something like that. No, I think it's um, lovely. Yeah, actually, it happened to me that um, my father who I wasn't quite as close to in my teens, but became closer to, you know, the over my, you know, beginning of my twenties really. So he had a fairly long, close relationship. Uh, but I remember when my marriage hit that hard place that you're talking about, and I was thinking of leaving my wife and he said, you know, he goes, you're not so perfect yourself. You know, there's things that you, you can and should be working on in the marriage, uh, which was, you know, we had a close enough relationship that, I mean, if he'd been a super critical dad, which he wasn't, I might have said, well, screw you. You can't tell me, you know, <laughs> about mm-hmm. that. What do you know? But he wasn't. So I was, and I had friends who said the same thing, kind of like, well, you're not, you know, you've got some issues yourself that is making your marriage hard. It's not all your wife. And it was very helpful to me. And I think that, you know, family ideally, not always, of course, but ideally are the ones that might have enough invested in you to be able to sort of face you with the hard truths that that other people may not feel comfortable doing or may not feel like they have kind of the, the right place in order to do it. And also to your point, you know, we, we live in a culture that's still very youth worshiping, where we sort of, you know, if the child feels that that's what they, you know, it's the right thing to do. And if, you know, then, um, and, th- and that's, you know, the whole idea of older people having wisdom and value and something that should be honored and preserved and relied upon has it really isn't a very active part of our culture. And I would say that ageism is sort of the last ism where it's still okay to to practice, you know, whereas every other ism is supposedly, you know, understandably being challenged. But ageism, you know, there's sort of a lip service to it, but but I don't know that it's really being challenged as a larger culture. It's a cultural thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, uh, like to talk about when I'm doing my work with individuals or giving trainings is that, uh, we seem to have in our culture, a hard time with grief, mm-hmm. but we prefer grievance over grief. It's a good and, way to put it. Yeah. yeah people like just get angry. You know, how dare you disconnect from me? How dare you cut me off? Or how dare you suggest something from, you know, speaking to the parent, how dare you right. suggest that maybe I should study something different or whatever it is. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we just seem to have a real preponderance for grievance. And one of the things that Marshall Rosenberg would say, he'd say, you know, when I'm angry, three things are true. One, there's something that I'm wanting that I'm not getting. Two, mm-hmm. I'm thinking it should be given to me. And three, I'm about to speak or behave in a way that virtually assures I will not get what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's brilliant. I love yeah. that too. That's great. It's so important to really know great, how yeah. to just like, okay, I can feel it coming on. You know, I'm going to have an amygdala hijack here and I'm going to pull right. back and uh-huh. I'm going to connect to like what's really important because what's really important when you look at it in its rawness is usually something that everyone can align with. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, if I just say it's my individuality, that's not like so important to the whole world, but that relationships thrive, that is, Mm -hmm. and if we could just place our attention on that, but it seems to me we're in a time now where we really have to learn grief 
and I'm guessing that's something that comes up for you a lot. Uh, you know, you've I've heard you say, you know, mothers are sobbing when they're speaking with you. Yeah. And, and but they're also looking for the fix, right? For sure. We're looking for the fix. Yeah, I think there's grief on both sides. I think that for parents um, having to grieve, even if they're not estranged, having to grieve um, that the relationship's not going to be kind of what they hoped it would be. Um, And for the adult child, I think the grieving that the parent's not able to provide what the, the added, that a child or adult child wishes that the parent could provide is also important. I think, you know, grieving is an important part of our um, maturity and resilience. So if we think about it from the perspective of romantic love, you know, we couples therapists often say that there's three phases, infatuation, disillusionment, and then mature love. Um, the disillusionment comes when we sort of stop being the perfect person for the other and they stop being the perfect person for us. And there, our real selves emerge into enter the, the actual relationship and conflict develops, uh, which is a point that a lot of people bail on the marriage or their relationship. Um, so a certain percentage of, of what moves things towards mature love is the ability to grieve that, yeah, I guess this person isn't going to be my everything. They're not going to be as attentive or as sexual or as adventurous or assertive or extroverted or whatever, whatever our ideals of romantic love is. And similarly for, for parenting that one has to grieve that, yeah, I guess I wish I'd had a parent who was more unconditionally loving or pushed me harder to succeed or is more protective or whatever, whatever that is. But grieving allows you to sort of, I think to Rosenberg's point, put aside the um, the anger and move more towards um, a kind of an acceptance, which is really a key part of maturation and resilience. Mm, yeah. Uh, I see we're coming to the end of our time. And um, one thing I like to include is, is poetry when I'm uh, working with people. And there's a a poem called Love Dogs by Rumi that speaks to to this type of grief that we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. Uh, One night a man was crying, Allah, Allah. His lips grew sweet with the praising until a cynic said, so I have heard you calling out, but have you ever gotten any response? The man had no answer for that. He quit praying and fell into a confused sleep. He dreamed he saw Kitter, the guide of souls in a thick green foliage. Why did you stop praising? Because I've never heard anything back. This longing you express is the return message. Mm. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is the connection. There are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. Mm. I, I I love that. Um, Lovely. Yeah. And there's also a, a, a very short poem by uh, Mary Oliver, The Uses of Sorrow. And she, underneath the title, she writes, In my sleep, I dreamed this poem. Someone I love once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. Mm, that's great. Yeah. 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 Well, speaking of Robert Bly, it's not, not exactly germane to our talk, but the one the one thing that I remember him saying was something like, what did the boulder say to the tree? Uh, the boulder said, oh, just passing through. <laughs> <laughs> Which is sort of a reflection on yeah, 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 yeah. You know, impermanence that, that, you know, yeah. like begins and ends and yeah, uh, and something for us to think about in terms of... Um, yeah, I wanted to just comment on something you said earlier about life is long. Like, you know, parents often say, well, I'm going to cut my kid out of my will. And, you know, they've hurt me so much. Why would I want to reward bad behavior? And, and I my, my commonly say is, look, you're a parent forever. You know, if your parents have died, you know, your parents still live within you and they may guide you in good ways or, or bad ways, but they're still there. And do you really want, what's your legacy? What do you want your legacy to be? Do you want it to be one that's punishing and rejecting? And even if you did feel punished or hurt, you have to assume that your child did the best that they could in the same way that parents do the best that they can when they're raising their children. Our adult children do the best that they can, even when they're estranging us. And so th- that's why approaching the whole thing with compassion and not acting on the anger, again, to return to Rosenberg's uh, Rosenberg, is that right? Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. my, my mother's maiden names. So that should be easy to remember. Oh, is that so? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
yeah, the wisdom of that of not acting on the anger, but sort of sitting with the feelings and being guided by that um, is really is really important because we are parents forever, and we continue to parent long, you know, from the grave, and so we we do need to think about our legacy. Mm-hmm. I want to thank you so much for your uh, making yourself available. I, I know you're very busy. And uh, yeah, I'm very grateful because I think this is so important. This is vital work for, for our world. Um, so in addition to his books, articles, and online interviews, Dr. Coleman offers a webinar series for estranged parents and grandparents a few times a year, and also a free Q&A every second Monday. Is that correct? Every yeah. Other. Every other Monday. Every other Monday. Okay. And for healthcare professionals who are working with estranged parents or estranged adult children, Dr. Coleman has created a professional online course that I highly recommend. I did take that course. Um, So that was, uh, I guess, last year when you did that. Uh So I want to thank you again. It's been really wonderful speaking with you. Yeah, it was lovely lovely to meet you and to to talk to you. And I, I learned a lot. So it was a great conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into NBC Life. For future episodes, be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube. For free resources or to book a private session with me, head over to rochellelam.com. Until the next time, stay sane, grateful, and generous.